Welcome back to Bargaining and More. This lecture covers a common shortcut in notation that you will see in the crisis bargaining literature. By and large, it is very helpful, but it comes with some important caveats that you need to know before you implement it. Let's get to it. Think back to last lecture, where we saw that in crisis bargaining models, we have two outcomes of interest, a war outcome and a peaceful settlement. What I'm going to be drawing up now is just going to focus on state A's payoffs. The reason being is that the principle that I'm going to be describing applies to all players, so doing it for both A and B would be redundant. If we have a peaceful settlement, then A receives X portion of the good, which it values at VA. So its total payoff is X times VA. In contrast, if the states fight a war, a wins with probability P and receives that quantity of value, VA. It must also pay a cost, so we subtract out CA from A's payoff. Here's the trick now. A very important property of expected utilities is that if you multiply all of a player's payoffs by some same positive constant, that the preference ordering of all of those outcomes will be maintained. What do I mean by that? Well, consider the scalar 1 divided by VA. So I'm going to multiply the same positive scalar across all different payoffs. You'll remember that VA is some value greater than 0. So when you have a value 1 divided by VA, that is also some positive value. So we're multiplying everything by the same positive value 1 divided by VA. Imagine that you were trying to compare the payoff for peace versus the payoff for war. Well, if x times VA is larger than P times VA minus CA, then that inequality is still going to hold true once we've multiplied both sides by the same quantity. It's not changing the ordering of those things. It's just changing how much we are looking at the magnitude of it, whether we're multiplying everything by 2 or 5 or 20. So what that means is that if we have, instead of these payoffs up here, we go ahead and multiply through everything, we could represent just as easily the payoff for a peaceful settlement as X and the payoff for war as P minus CA divided by VA. This case up here, case one, where we don't have the scalar being implemented, if we just get rid of that multiplied by one, divided by VA, is equivalent to this version of the representation here. It's the same thing, even though, of course, the numbers actually appear different because we have VAs floating in different places, whether we're looking at the first case or the second case. Now, you'll see that in the second case, there's less stuff there. There are fewer different components in that utility, and so it would just be naturally preferred to look at the second case than the first case. But the shortcut that we take in the crisis bargaining literature goes a step further. Remember that CA is also some value greater than zero, which means that CA divided by VA is also a value greater than zero. And this is where things become a little bit tricky. The way that we talk about the good at stake in the crisis bargaining literature, by and large, is to standardize it at value 1. We just describe VA equal to 1 so that we can rewrite this payoff here as P minus CA, with CA, that cost of war, now implicitly covering two things. First, the standard material cost, how many people are going to die, how many buildings are going to be destroyed, and second, how much the state in question actually values the good. So that if we have a very large value of the good at stake, that we would internalize each life lost at a smaller quantity than if we just didn't care at all about the good at stake if VA was close to zero, if our actual valuation was basically nothing. And so this is the type of payoff that you're going to be looking at, this third case here where we've made the standardization. This is the case that you're going to be looking at by and large within the crisis bargaining literature, where your payoff for a settlement is X 
and your payoff for war is 1 minus P minus CA. Of course, with state B, it would be a little bit different. We would have 1 minus X and 1 minus P minus CB, but the same sort of thing is going on there. Why do we do that? Well, you know, going from the first case to the second case to the third case, we're suppressing notation, which means there's going to be one less thing we have to keep writing. And when we get to more and more complicated models, we're going to have more and more other variables be introduced. So to reduce notational complexity, it's helpful to go with the third case. The problem, though, is that if you forget what CA actually means when you're using this third case, you're going to run into problems with how you interpret the model. So for example, I may want to conduct a comparative static on the material cost of war, what happens when more people are going to die and more buildings are going to be destroyed. If I do that by increasing this value CA, I'm actually doing two things implicitly. I am changing the value of the costs, the actual material stuff that's going to be lost. And I'm also manipulating the value of the prize because in fact, CA divided by VA is really what this CA here is representing. So when it becomes important to try to distinguish between the value of the prize and the material costs of war, we're going to have to disaggregate that quantity, that CA quantity. Otherwise, though, we're going to try to keep the notation simple and just leave it as minus CA as your cost for war. So I hope you enjoyed this lecture. For now, until much later in the course, we're going to be focusing on just CA. And then you'll see later on where having one quantity to represent both the cost and the value of the prize can, can become a problem. So you'll see what more what's going on there much later on in this course. Hope you enjoyed this lecture. Hope to see you next time. Take care.